Sorry, there's going to be a Bible reading. Um, better find it. It's going to be John chapter 15, verses 9 to 17. Okay. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your love may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love one another. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark. If I haven't met you before, I'm just going to get set up up here. Uh, if you can't see the screen, you might like to shuffle in a little bit from the sides. There's going to be some things up there which are probably quite useful for you to be able to see. Uh, so if you need to, now would be a good time for you to move. Uh, as has been mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about the topic of friendship today. But I think after that kid's song, I don't know whether there's anything left for me really to say. I think it's, it's all been said in... Wonderful eloquence. Uh, no, scripture does speak on this topic of friendship quite helpfully for us. And so why don't we pray and then uh, we'll have a think about what God's word teaches. Heavenly Father, thank you that the lordship of Jesus knows no boundaries. Thank you that every single inch of our lives belongs to him and that he governs it. Thank you for the wisdom that your word supplies to teach us how to live in all of life. Father, as we think about this topic of friendship today, help us to be really conscious that Jesus governs this area of our lives and help us to willingly submit to his instructions and his guidance and his wisdom. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Thinking about the topic of friendship, and really what better place is there to start thinking about the topic of friendship than with the people who wrote the book on friendship? I am, of course, talking about the wonderful 1990s sitcom, Friends. You know the TV show, Friends? Uh, it's a show about six 20-somethings living in New York City. And I just, I love the TV show, Friends. Even if the world that those people live in, where they seemingly spend about half their lives at a coffee shop, even if that world is about as realistic as Lord of the Rings, I still love that show. I love the TV show Friends, and a lot of other people love that TV show too. Do you know, it's actually it's one of the most popular and one of the most financially profitable TV programs ever made, Friends. And I think that really what's at the heart of that TV show's success, what made it so popular is the relationships between these six friends, the kind of friendship that you see week after week in this TV show. These characters, they, they had a friendship that was just so desirable. They were so committed to one another through thick and thin. They were so close with one another, spending almost every minute of every day with one of their other close friends. I mean, even the theme song of this TV show, every single week saying, I'll be there for you. That was the message of the TV show, Friends. And that's the dream when it comes to friendship, isn't it? Uh, David Schwimmer, who was one of the actors who played a character on the show called Ross, uh, he once said, it's a fantasy for a lot of people. Having a group of friends who become like family. And he is, he's right in more ways than he realises as he says that, isn't it? Because for many people, that's all that it is. A fantasy to have such a group of friends. Because the reality in our world is actually that loneliness is a far bigger problem than we care to admit. There have been some recent studies that have been done in Australia that say that around 20% of Australians describe themselves as lonely people. 
It's about the same percentage of people who also report that they don't even have one single close friend with who they could talk about a personal problem. Uh, what's really revealing as you kind of delve into these uh, surveys that have been done recently on the topics of friendship and loneliness is when you break down how loneliness exists across different age brackets. There's some recent research in, uh, out of a university in Chicago that's found that loneliness is twice as bad for old people's health as obesity is. That's shocking, isn't it? Loneliness is twice as bad for old people's health as obesity. And it's almost as great a cause of death as poverty. We're talking about loneliness here. Shocking as that is, it's even more shocking when you break it down in the, the younger age category of 18 to sort of 34, 35 year olds. Because in, in that age bracket, people score higher on every measure of loneliness and associated anxiety and depression that comes from that than at any other age bracket. Uh, and all the available research indicates that the numbers across the board uh, that they're growing. And to me, that's very counterintuitive. I wonder if that comes as, as a surprise to you this morning as you hear those numbers, because the impression that you would get as you look around our world is that we are living in a place where, where friendliness is at an all-time high. Uh, we've got more friends and we are more connected to people than we've ever been at any other time in human history. Uh, anthropologists have, have uh, done some studies and indicated that the human brain is really only capable of keeping track of about 150 relational connections, 150 relationships, somewhere in that kind of vicinity. Now, when our grandparents were growing up, uh, your relational connections were more or less limited to around that kind of number, limited by the people who lived in your street or in your town, or maybe if you were in, in part of some kind of a, a local club. It, it was pretty tough to establish and then to go on nurturing more relationships than those kind of natural boundaries would allow. But these days, in 2016, if you only have 150 friends, well then chances are people are probably gonna look at you a little bit funny. Because social media has blown the roof off our capacity for friendships, hasn't it? Uh, now there is just this endless sea of people for you to friend and it's only just a click away. In case you're interested, the average Facebook user currently has 336 friends. Uh, our capacity as a species for friendship appears to have changed. But more than that, social media is changing the way that we are friends with one another. It's changing the way we interact with, with our friends. Now, this has all been well documented, and I won't bore you with the details, but basically people are starting to realize that for all the talk of connectedness that this kind of modern social media age throws at us, that actually social media is doing considerable damage to our friendships. The friendships that social media propagates are for the most part uh, really just an illusion. Because online friendships, they have that kind of, uh, they don't have that depth of intimacy that real relationships do. They give you a, a false sense of what's going on in someone's life because that person only chooses to share the sort of polished version of their life with you. And furthermore, social media, it kind of tends to reward self-centeredness. The more you post about yourself and draw attention to yourself, the more successful you are at social media. And self-centeredness, let's face it, makes somebody a pretty lousy friend. Now, I don't think social media is all bad. But I do think that it can really be damaging to our real life friendships. And it can be a hindrance to friendships rather than a support. I think that many of us really long for the experience of a close group of friends, just like the TV show. But this, this social media world just seems to be putting that reality further and further out of our grasp. It's no wonder that there's a recent study of Facebook users shows that the amount of time that you spend on Facebook each day is inversely related to how happy you report yourself to be. The picture that I'm trying to paint for you with all of these statistics and all of this uh, information is that we are more connected than we have ever been, and yet real friendships have never been so hard to find as they are today. Now, I wonder how true that picture is for people sitting right here this morning, people here in Wollongong Baptist Church. I'm relatively new to WBC, I've been here for, for about six months now, 
so perhaps I'm not in a position to really judge what the state of friendships is amongst people in WBC, but in a church as big as ours, with people from as many different diverse backgrounds as ours, with people as geographically spread out around the area as they are in our church, I think it would hardly be surprising if there were people here today who felt disconnected, who felt lonely, who felt a lack of friendship. That would hardly be surprising. But I hope that you'll agree with me that that should not be the case, should it? In our church, really in any church, there should not be lonely people. Churches should be places that are marked by plentiful, substantial, meaningful friendships. Now, in churches, uh, I I think that we don't often talk about the topic of friendship. Uh, I was racking my brain this week, and I don't think I've ever heard a sermon on friendship. I wonder if you're in the same boat as me with that. But the truth is that the theme of friendship, well, that takes us actually right to the heart of the Bible's message. Because in the Bible, we meet God who is relational. God who has existed from eternity in a a relationship of loving friendship within himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he has created us humans in his image as relational beings, uniquely able to relate to God in love. And then throughout the Bible, we see God referring to his people, who refers to those people who belong to him as his friends. In the book of Exodus, we read that God speaks with Moses as a man speaks to his friend. God describes Abraham as my friend. Jesus himself was criticized for being a friend of sinners. And as we read just a minute ago in that passage in John 15, we see Jesus referring to his followers as his friends. And really, this this friendship with God, that's the reason that Jesus came to earth to restore that relationship, that friendship that we had broken. But it's important that we understand that God's salvation plan, it doesn't only restore kind of our vertical relationship with God, it actually also creates horizontal relationships of of loving friendship between human beings in God's family. So God calls us to himself, but not as individuals. He calls us to himself as a community, as members of a a new community. And so deep relationships, they can and they should develop as we grow together as a church. In a very real sense, we are saved for friendship. So it's right and it's important that we spend time thinking about Christian friendships uh, because Christians are not supposed to be lone rangers. And so today what I'm going to try and do is unpack what exactly a Christian friendship looks like? Uh, What is it that makes a friendship distinctly Christian? Now, for the purposes of this sermon, please understand that I'm not going to be talking today about uh, your relationships with people who are not Christians. Uh, Those friendships are important. It's important that we uh, cultivate those friendships. But today, I want to be talking exclusively about the relationships between fellow Christians, okay? Because there is something unique about those relationships. So what I want to do today is I want to propose to you a Christian model of friendship. That is a a way of understanding friendship that's actually built upon the gospel itself, that grows out of the gospel. And in this model, what there are are three elements which make up a Christian friendship, three kind of building blocks, if you want to think of it like that. And you can see them on this diagram here. The first is this. Christian friendship involves genuine affection towards each other. Secondly, a Christian friendship involves sacrificial service, doing good to another person. And thirdly, a Christian friendship involves a shared purpose that is working together towards the same goal. Now, each of these elements, this is something that the gospel teaches us to value, teaches us to prioritize. And please realize too, as you see these three categories here, these are three things that are most clearly demonstrated by the Lord Jesus himself. Now in showing you this three stage model today, what I'm actually gonna be arguing is that Christian friendship exists where these three things overlap. So if you were to take away any one of these three elements of Christian friendships, well, then you wouldn't actually have a Christian friendship. Do you see how that works? 
if you got rid of shared purpose, if you, if you got rid of kind of a sense of burden for a cause, well then your relationship with that other person, if all you had was genuine affection and a sacrificial service of them, what you're really talking about there is a relationship of kind of being buddies with somebody. That you like hanging out with them, but you don't like there being any obligation to your relationship. You don't like any goal in your relationship. Now, if that's all you have, that's not a Christian friendship. Or if your relationship isn't marked by sacrificial service, if all you've got is kind of a shared purpose, we like something together, we're here for a reason and we're affectionate towards one another, well, what are you? You're kind of more supporters than friends, really. You perhaps like each other because you follow the same team or because you appreciate the same things. But again, that's not Christian friendship. What about if you got rid of the the genuine affection? If all you had was a shared purpose, a common goal, and a willingness to sacrifice for one another, well, what have you got there? Well, really, that's describing the relationship of colleagues and not friends. You're people who are committed to the same cause. You're willing to work towards it together. But again, that's, that's not Christian friendship. Truly Christian friendships exist when all three of those elements are present. And so what I want to do is just to have a think about each of those three elements in turn, okay? So firstly, let's have a think about genuine affection. Now, what do I mean by genuine affection? Well, genuine affection is a kind of a a valuing of the other person. It's a, a loving and esteeming, a respecting of that other person, thinking of that other person as important and dignified. Now, it kind of almost goes without saying, really, that Christian friendships involve genuine affection because the gospel teaches us genuine affection towards one another, doesn't it? Because in the gospel, we see God revealed as someone who has genuine affection towards us. In the gospel, God sets his love upon us and he says, you, I'm going to love you. I'm going to take care of you. You are going to be mine. You are precious and important to me. And Jesus really embodies that kind of genuine affection, doesn't he? Remember in John 15, that passage we read earlier, Jesus says in verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. You see, Jesus loves his friends. He has genuine affection for his friends. Practically every time you meet Jesus in the Bible, you see him kind of overflowing with affection for his people, even when there are so many good reasons for him not to be affectionate towards them. Just think about it. Jesus, he is, he is patient with the ignorant. He's welcoming with the imperfect. He's attentive to the unimportant. He's gentle to the damaged. Jesus demonstrates this kind of genuine affection time and time again towards his friends. He loves them. He values them. He honors them. And that genuine affection that the gospel reveals and that Jesus embodies, well, now that's our task to have for one another, isn't it? I just look what Jesus says later in verse 12 there. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Love each other as I have loved you. He's telling us to have the same affection towards one another that God has showed to us. Genuine affection. It's the first building block of Christian friendship. Now, with each of these three building blocks, what I'd like to do with you here today is just to offer you one simple suggestion for how this principle might apply to you and your particular set of friendships and relationships. So I just want to give you one suggestion for each of them. They'll be reasonably brief. How do we see genuine affection? How do we express it in our friendships, our relationships with one another? Well, I wonder if you've ever had the experience, maybe at morning tea after church, where you're talking to somebody and they are just enthralled with every word coming out of your mouth. You ever had that experience? They're paying such close attention to you, showing such a real interest in you. Have you ever had that? I'm sure we've all had the opposite, where the person that we're talking to is just looking over our shoulder or checking their phone every minute, looking for an escape from the conversation. But have you ever experienced somebody paying lavish attention to you in conversation? Have you ever realised, talking to somebody, that for the last half an hour you haven't learnt anything new about them because they have just been bombarding you with question after question, so intrigued by every word coming out of your mouth. They're they're laughing at all of your jokes and they're just thrilled to be paying attention to you. Have you ever experienced that? 
it's a really beautiful thing to witness and it's a really beautiful thing to be on the receiving end of. But let's be honest here. When we do experience that, it's not because we are the most interesting person in the room, is it? It's not because we are somehow worthy of that much attention. When we experience that, it's because that person that we are speaking to is showing genuine affection towards us for the sake of our friendship. And they want to express that by being attentive to you. It's a beautiful way to express this value. Now, I'm not suggesting here that you have to kind of go around manufacturing fake interest for people who you're not really interested in. No, what I'm suggesting here is that this kind of love, this kind of lavishing attention upon another person, that is built upon a recognition that the person that you're speaking to is of infinite value. Do you get that? That the, this person who you are speaking to this morning over morning tea, they are of infinite value because they were created in the image of God. They have dignity and worth and honour. And, and if we can't see that right now, if that person that we are talking to looks ordinary or looks uninteresting, well, then we need to work a little bit harder to see that person like God sees them. That's where genuine affection is born out of, out of a, a gospel realisation that this person is so important that the God of the universe would die for them. And so it's entirely correct that you see that person as valuable too. So if you're someone who believes the gospel here this morning, then let me challenge you to show genuine affection to others in the way that you interact with them, even today over morning tea. Hold them in high regard. See them as valuable. And so be lavish in the way that you give attention to them. That's one way that this first building block of Christian friendships might apply. But having genuine affection for other people, well, that's not enough for true friendship in and of itself, is it? If all you had was genuine affection, well, then your relationship with this other person would probably be characterised as more kind of a relationship with a pet than with another person. In, in human friendships, you've got to have more than just positive feelings towards somebody else, don't you? There has to be actions built upon this affection. There has to be sacrificial service towards that other person taking place in a friendship. And so that's the second building block of Christian friendships, sacrificial service. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm only going to talk about this one briefly because I think this is the, the most uh, simple and easy to understand of the three. Sacrificial service, uh, again, we take our cue from the gospel, don't we? We take our cue from Jesus. We look to him and we learn how to relate to our friends. How did Jesus relate to his friends? Well, he surrendered his life for them so that they could have life. He shed his blood so that they could be cleansed. Out of his love for us, he gives of himself freely, undeservedly. We hadn't done anything to deserve Jesus' sacrifice. In fact, quite the opposite. But Jesus considered us his friends, and so he performed the greatest act of sacrificial service in all of history. And again, Jesus expects us to do likewise, doesn't he? Look at what Jesus says in verses 12 to 14 of John 15. He says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. How do Christian friends relate to one another? Well, as Jesus did, by laying down your life for them by choosing to give of yourself in costly ways for the sake of that other person's good. Now, applying this principle, this is not complicated. There are about a million practical ways that we can apply this principle every single day. You can serve someone sacrificially simply by taking responsibility to meet someone's physical needs. It might be showing uh, generosity towards that person. Even simple thoughtfulness towards someone, you know, anticipating one of their needs. I tell you that some of the best friendships have been expressed and even really strengthened by relatively insignificant actions. Actions like listening to someone's concerns or worries. Or like writing an encouraging note to someone before they go to a doctor's appointment. Or giving a lift to hospital or looking after someone's kids for the afternoon. These are all very simple, very practical ways that you can sacrificially serve your friends. And it's a good question to ask as an individual, perhaps even better as a household, how can we serve our friends? 
How can we serve our friends? You might like to think or talk about that in the car ride home from church today. It'd be a good question to ponder. Because Christian friendships involve sacrificially serving the other person. So thirdly, the third and last building block of Christian friendships is shared purpose. Now, there's a special kind of bond that you can form, and it's really only kind of possible when you're engaged with somebody in kind of a shared purpose, in a shared task. Think about like soldiers in a war, the camaraderie they experience, the, that closeness, that strength of relationship that's only possible when you've journeyed with someone towards a common goal. And that, too, is what we find in the gospel, in our salvation, in our friendship with Jesus. Look what Jesus says Verses 14 and 15 of the passage, he says, You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You see, Jesus saves us and then he invites us into his work. The work of making his name known in the world, his gospel known to the nations. This work of seeing people, seeing each other grow into the glorious maturity of the image of Christ. Jesus shares that purpose with us as his friends. And so now our friendships with one another, we share that same purpose. Uh, C.S. Lewis once wrote an essay on friendship. It's a great little read. And he says that uh, with, with lovers, the characteristic pose of lovers that you see is often them facing face to face, delighting in one another. That's their characteristic pose. But the characteristic pose of friends, well, that's side by side. It's shoulder to shoulder. Uh, you see, as Christian friends, we share a purpose. We share a mission. And that means that as friends, our friendships should never kind of stand still. They're never stationary. They're always going somewhere. Our friendships exist partly to help one another to grow in faith. Our friendships exist partly for the sake of Jesus' mission to the nations. Our friendships exist for the kingdom. In our friendships, what we do is we, we say to one another, come on. Keep going. Let's go this way. We can do this. I'm here to help you. You're here to help me. This is worth it for Jesus. That's a Christian friendship. As Christians who are friends, we share a purpose. And our friendships should be shaped around that fact. And I think that this third area is actually probably the one where most of us fail. I think that this is probably the one where most of our friendships are revealed to be not distinctly Christian after all. Let me suggest that one of the key ways that we can prioritise our shared purpose of, in the gospel is to learn how to minister God's word to one another. That is, to speak the truth of God's word into one another's lives in such a way that it stimulates growth where we need growing, that it rebukes us where we need rebuking, that it comforts us where we need comforting, that's what it means to, to minister God's word to one another. And I think that we really need to learn how to do this. Uh, too often in our friendships, we struggle to get beyond kind of the, the superficial level of interactions. Uh, there's an American pastor and writer called Paul Tripp, and he has this quote, and this is a quote which I find uncomfortably accurate as a description of many of my friendships. Paul writes, We live in interwoven networks of terminally casual relationships. We live with the delusion that we know one another, but we really don't. We call our easygoing, self-protective, and often theologically platitudinous conversations fellowship, but they seldom ever reach the threshold of true fellowship. We know cold demographic details about one another, married or single, type of job, number of kids, general location of housing, etc but we know little about the struggle of faith that's waged every day behind well-maintained personal boundaries. Privatism is not just practiced by the lonely unbeliever, it's rampant in the church as well. I find in those words a really strong rebuke because often we can be reluctant to reveal, as he says, that struggle of faith that is going on every single day within us. 
Often it's because of a perception that everyone else has their lives kind of completely under control and that they would be horrified if they really knew the messy insides going on behind our well-organised exterior. But that's just simply not true, is it? The Bible is clear that we are all, every single one of us sitting in this room today, we are deeply flawed individuals. More than that, we're living in a broken world. And so every single one of us in different ways at different times is going to face battles against difficult circumstances, against persistent sins. And so we should not be surprised when we find that in one another. What we should be when we find that in one another is bold enough to open the darkest corners of our lives to each other, to speak God's truth into those places as friends, to speak beyond that kind of self-protective exterior that we put up into the messy realities of our lives. We need to do that for one another, for the sake of our shared purpose of seeing God honoured in the world. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, well, that's all well and good, but I'm never going to be the person to minister God's word to somebody else. That's just not me. I'm not capable of doing that. I'm too shy to do that. I'm too introverted to do that. Uh, It would be so awkward if I was to do that. Uh, My faith isn't strong enough to give advice to somebody else. Uh, I just don't know my Bible well enough to minister God's word to somebody else. I don't know what particular truth that person needs me to speak, and so I'm not going to do it. Maybe you're sitting there today and some of those hesitations resonate with you. And I'll be the first one to say that those hesitations resonate with me as well because they are the exact same doubts that run through my head when there is an opportunity to minister God's word to somebody. But let let me say to you that honestly, when I am struggling or when things in life are hard for me, it's very rare that I need an expert to minister God's word to me. And more often than not, I need a, a friend who is courageous enough just to point me to the things that I already know, but I just find hard to accept or hard to live by. They don't need to be saying it eloquently, but I just need friends who will speak frequent reminders to me about the amazing grace of God revealed in the gospel of Jesus. I need to be reminded of the message that brings me hope no matter how dire my circumstances or how deep my sin. I need to be reminded that I am a much-loved child of God, completely accepted by him, able to call God my father because of Christ's death for me. I need to be reminded that I've received the Holy Spirit and that I'm a new person now. I have a new power within me, and so I don't have to be trapped by the same destructive patterns of thinking and of behavior. Those are the sorts of friendships that I need Those are the sorts of friendships that I want. I don't want friends who are too afraid to rebuke me or too shy to minister God's word to me. I want friends who share my purpose of seeing God honoured and who will help me to do that. Don't you want that too? I I think that there is this perception that there's a certain niceness uh, to a friendship where you can just kind of be yourself. You know, you can just kind of let it all hang out, so to speak. But what I really need are relationships in which I'll be encouraged to become better than myself. Uh, Myself needs to grow a little bit each day. I don't want to be the same myself that I was yesterday. I want to be the sort of myself that is growing continually each day to become a more Christ-like person. And I need friends that will help me to do that. I think we all do. So there's my one suggestion for how our friendships at WBC can reflect our shared purpose by learning how to minister God's word to each other. So my proposal today has been that true Christian friendship exists when genuine affection, sacrificial service, and shared purpose overlap, and that if our friendships are lacking any one of those three elements, then they're not truly Christian friendships built upon the gospel. I'm conscious as well at this point, as we see the Bible's teaching on what Christian friendships are supposed to look like, we see this image of what I think is a pretty desirable and a pretty attractive model of friendship. Well, we can be easily tempted to kind of look around at our existing network of friends and to think, well, my friends don't seem to be living up to this. Uh, My friends are not pulling their weight in this kind of a model. Uh, Maybe you're tempted to think that, but let me urge you not to think that today. 
Because Jesus teaches us to take the plank out of our own eye before we reach for the speck in our brothers. And so instead of asking, instead of thinking that, we should be asking the question of ourselves, well, what sort of a friend am I? Don't wait for somebody else to be a good friend to you. Take the initiative to be a good friend yourself first. I'm confident that if we examine ourselves honestly, we'll all find plenty of ways that we need to improve as friends. And God willing, our church will continue to grow into a truly friendly place where loneliness doesn't exist. The other possibility for some of you here today, I'm sure, will be perhaps to feel sorrow or to feel a sadness over a lack of quality friendships in your life. And so with that reality in mind, let me just close today by drawing us back to the truth in the gospel that God has befriended us. There's an old story uh, from Persia about a king named King Abbas uh, who was really frustrated at his inability to make genuine friendships with anybody because any time he would meet people, they would bow down to him, they would show him respect and reverence and so it was hard for him to develop intimacy with everyone. Well, one day he decided that he would take off his royal robes and he would go down into his palace and indeed go down to the servants' quarters, the lowest of the low places, in the palace to see who he could meet. And right at the bottom of the palace, uh, he found the stoker, the one who uh, stoked the fire that heated the entire palace. And he got chatting to this stoker, and they got on so well that King Abbas continued to every day come down and meet with him. And over many, many weeks, these two became close friends. And after a while, the king thought, well, it's probably time for me to reveal my true identity. And so he, he said, I am Abbas, your king. And you are my friend. So I want to give you anything you ask for, up to half my kingdom. Well, the stoker, as the story goes, replies and he says, you've already given me the most precious thing this life affords, your friendship, and I ask for nothing more. Friends, Jesus left the glory of the throne room of heaven to become a servant who was even willing to die for us on the cross. He could not have gone lower than that. And he did it that we might be his friends. If we know him, we already have the most precious thing that this life affords. We can and we should pursue human friendships, friendships with other Christians, but we must always remember that we'll never find anyone who loves us or who sacrifices for us or who journeys with us better than Jesus does himself. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are a friend to sinners. Thank you that when we were your enemies, you still came to us in love and made us your own. Thank you that you lavish your affection on us. Thank you that you give of yourself freely and undeservedly for us. And thank you that you now invite us into your purpose, the purpose of the kingdom of God. Lord, help us to cherish that friendship that we have with you and help us please to take our cues for what it means to be good friends from you. Lord, give us eyes to see in our own lives areas where we need to grow, areas where we need to uh, get up and be proactive in the way that we relate to our friends. Help us to be good friends, we pray, for the sake of your glorious name. Amen.